Time now for Morning Rounds with CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook and CBS News contributor Dr. Holly Phillips. First up, a new study uncovers an alarming trend in colon cancer rates. A new study finds the number of colon cancer cases in people under age 50 rose by more than 11 percent over a decade, while for people over 50, the number of cases dropped by two and a half percent. This comes as a recent report helped answer a question that's troubled oncologists. Why do some patients with colon cancer survive longer than others? Here's John with more. Two years ago, at age 48, Lisa Glasgow had surgery for what was thought to be an early stage colon cancer. It had actually spread across my body. So at that point, they staged it stage four colon cancer, not in a terminal sense, but in the fact that it had moved. She had six months of chemotherapy, but earlier this year, the cancer returned. Is it okay if I get to your point? Prompting another round. Today's a halfway through mark. The side effects are hitting me a little bit harder than they did last year. Her cancer had started on the right side of the colon, a location that can be more deadly. The study of patients with advanced colon cancer found those with tumors on the right side survived an average of 19 months, compared to 33 months for those with tumors on the left side. Dr. Richard Goldberg is an oncologist with the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center and is a co-author of the study. This data shows that we ought to be thinking differently about patients depending on where their cancer arose. Patients with cancer on the right side tend to have fewer early symptoms and are often diagnosed later. One reason? Benign right-sided polyps can be harder to spot during a colonoscopy. Many polyps are obvious, like this one that looks like a mushroom. But polyps on the right side tend to be flat, increasing the odds of being missed and eventually turning into cancer. When I go to clinic next time, I'm going to be thinking, right side, left side, different treatment. So, John, what does this mean for treatment, ultimately? Well, that different treatment he was talking about was the suggestion in this study that it's possible that certain types of chemotherapy work better on the right side of the colon, mm -hmm. if you have cancer starting there, than on the left side, and that we're going to need more studies for that. But I think for people at home, the take-home message here is we talked about that right side of the colon. That's where the polyps tend to be flat and much more difficult to see yeah. and more deadly potentially. So if you're at home and you're about to get a colonoscopy and they want you to do that prep, I know nobody wants to do it and everybody complains about it, but you really have to do the prep because here's the thing, I'm a gastroenterologist. When you're going in there and looking, if there's debris around, it can cover these subtle flat polyps. So if you want to help yourself do the prep, it sure beats chemo. All right, moving on, a deadly week on Mount Everest has put a spotlight on a condition familiar to many who visited the Rocky Mountain states, altitude sickness. All right, so Holly, what exactly is altitude sickness? Well, I mean, altitude, altitude sickness is actually a term that really refers to a whole constellation of symptoms that happen when we go from low altitudes to high altitudes quickly. Uh, at higher altitudes, there's lower air pressure, and ultimately that makes your body have to function with less oxygen temporarily until the body acclimatizes and gets used to it. Uh, but while you have the altitude sickness, it can cause symptoms like nausea, vomiting, shortness of breath, sleep difficulty, and in very severe cases, a uh, fluid can build up in the brain and in the lungs. John, what's behind the more severe cases that we've been seeing? Well, when you're talking about going to 17, 18,000 feet, like at the base camp, going up to 29,000 at the, at the summit of Everett, you're talking about a whole different story here. So it's very interesting in terms of the amount of oxygen in the blood. It's 21% in the atmosphere right. at sea level. When you go up to Mount Everest, it's still 21% oxygen in the atmosphere. What's different is the barometric pressure. Could, we could be like half of normal down at the base camp. What that means is simply barometric pressure, think about it as the force that drives the oxygen from the outside into your lungs, from your lungs into your bloodstream, to your heart, and to your brain and the rest of your body. So what happens when you get up really high is there's less of a force driving that oxygen into your system. Now think about what happens when the barometric pressure drops that could mean that a storm is coming. Yep. So if suddenly there is a storm, the barometric pressure could drop even further, and changes like that that happen suddenly up on the top of the mountain can really make a difference between life and death 
for these climbers. So Holly, most of us are not climbers, but a lot of people could be traveling to high altitude areas. Is there a way to prevent altitude sickness? Well, you know, there are some techniques. It, you know, it's ideal to try and go up to high altitudes slowly, you know, a thousand, a thousand feet at a time. Uh, there are some medications. Acetazolamide is a medicine that makes you basically breathe faster, so you're taking in more oxygen. Staying hydrated is incredibly important. But, you know, one of the things that, that I think is unique about altitude sickness is not only is it a little bit hard to prevent, but it's very hard to predict who will get it and when. A couple of months ago, I went with my family. We went to Colorado. So from here in New York City, which is just above sea level, right? We're at 33 feet above sea level. We went up to about that, uh, that, uh, 7,000 feet in Colorado. I got sick. My older daughter got sick. My husband and younger daughter were just fine. And we were all drinking water, trying to do what we could. Um, so a, a, sometimes it's just the roll of the dice. It's really interesting. You know, there's some studies about genes. There are different genes that get turned on and turned off when people acclimatize mm -hmm. to height. Uh, and thousands of genes wow. are involved. So there's wow. some studies. Dr. Robert Roche out, out in Colorado is doing uh, studies on this. And so that could help explain why some people who are able to uh, do fine at altitude and other people exactly. can't. So my husband and younger daughter have the, have the magic genes <laughs> all right, finally this morning, complain all you want about your busy schedule, but according to one study, it might be helping your brain. Researchers tested more than 300 people aged 50 to 89 on cognitive functions, including memory, reasoning, and mental quickness. They also asked them how busy they were, and according to the researchers, the busier they were, the higher they scored. Yeah, I mean, this to me goes along with so much of what neurologists have been saying mm -hmm. for a while. You know, try to, as we age, do mind games, you know, memory things, crossword puzzles, whatever we can do to keep our minds stimulated. Right. But now it seems just being busy, you know, may have the same effect. So let me get this straight. You don't want to be a busybody, but you want to have a body that's busy. Busy. Oh, Very good. I like okay. that, John ah, LaPook. Nice. Write that down. <laughs> All right, then with that, thank you both, Doctors John LaPook and Holly Phillips. Thanks.